Good morning, and welcome to worship on this sixth Sunday after Pentecost. My name is Pastor Seth Novak, and on behalf of the entire community of Agnus Day Lutheran Church, I'd like to thank you for being at this worship service today. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a worship bulletin with the order of service from the link in the video description below. Before we begin our worship, I'd like to invite us to take a moment to share prayer requests from our community. You may feel free to share any prayers of concern or gratitude that you might have in the chat or in the comments, being mindful of privacy in this public space. Today we hold in prayer Marion A., who is approaching the end of her life. At the time of this recording, she is about to be transferred to Hospice House. We pray for comfort and rest for Marion and for consolation from Masaharu. You'll also have the opportunity to include uh, your prayers as part of the intercessory prayers before we celebrate Holy Communion. As part of our prayers this summer, we'll be remembering the different mission start ministries in our synod. Each week, we'll pray for a new ministry begun within the last 13 years in Southwest Washington. Anus Day began as a mission start congregation, and so we are glad to support our siblings in Christ through prayer, just as we ourselves have been supported. I'll now invite you to turn to your bulletin as we continue with our order of service. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for the life of the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I invite you to please join me in our hymn.
be with you. Let us pray. God of the covenant, in our baptism you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage you gave the apostles that we may faithfully witness your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel as he ministers to the exiles in Babylon. Chapter 2. A voice said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard the speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to second letter to the Corinthians, the eighth chapter. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether it is in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than is seen in me, or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelation. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weaknesses. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed them. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that's been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? the brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us as well? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. 
and he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts. To wear sandals, but not to bring a change of clothes. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet off as a warning against them. And so they went out and they proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we read this story from Mark's Gospel today, I wonder, does it make you uncomfortable? Mark flat out says that Jesus could do no deed of power there in Nazareth because of the unbelief of the people. How does that square with your image of Jesus? Does that change how you think about him? If it does make you uncomfortable, I think that that's okay. It sure made Matthew uncomfortable. Matthew read Mark's gospel before writing his own and used Mark's as kind of a template. And when Matthew tells this same story, he changes it ever so slightly to say that Jesus did not do many deeds of power in Nazareth, but he leaves it open as to whether or not Jesus was able. Whenever Scripture makes us uncomfortable, I find it interesting to ask why. Why does Jesus' inability to do deeds of power in his hometown make us uncomfortable? Is it because as God's son, this story challenges our idea of God's almightiness? Is it because the unbelief of the people seems so potent? Maybe this story makes you worry about your own unbelief or question God's ability to work in your own life. What I find fascinating about this text is that it so often compels us to do just what Matthew did, to defend Jesus. We so dislike the idea of Jesus inability to act, that we start to explain it away or try to deny it somehow. It kind of reminds me of the scene in C.S. Lewis, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when Lucy and Susan approach the lifeless Aslan bound upon the stone table. In their grief, they pity poor, helpless Aslan, and even in death, they try to remove his restraints to give him some dignity back. But they can't just as they cannot do the thing they wish most, which is to bring him back to life. And they walk away despondent. We don't like to think of God as weak, as ineffectual, as helpless. Our God is an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing God, right? God can do anything God wants. But if that's the case, why is Jesus so helpless in Nazareth? As we approach the story, we may try to remove his bonds like the girls trying to unbind the lion, to rationalize and theologize, but the truth is still left lying on the table, staring us in the face. Jesus could do no deed of power there. In that moment, at that place and time, Jesus is weak. Mark's story confronts us with this weakness of Jesus. But he doesn't present that weakness as a failure. I learned something this week that I found very interesting. First of all, the word hometown in Greek can mean anything from hometown to homeland. In other words, it might not refer just to Nazareth, but to the whole area around it. Second, Jesus' neighbors call him a carpenter. The Greek word means a craftsman or a builder. It's a step above an unskilled day laborer, but still a very low-status job. And I learned this week that these carpenters, these builders, were itinerant, which means that they lived in one place with their family, 
but they spent most of their time away from home looking for work. That means that throughout the rest of the countryside around Nazareth and all those surrounding villages of Jesus' homeland, all those people would have known Jesus just as well, at least by reputation, as the people in Nazareth. They would have had the same reaction as the Nazareans. Jesus would have been amazed at their unbelief, and he would not have been able to do any deeds of power in those villages either. Now, according to Mark, when Jesus realizes that he can't do anything more himself, he turns to the disciples. Now, let me just remind you at this point that these are the same disciples that scarcely a chapter ago were being berated by Jesus for their own lack of faith in the boat after the storm. Remember that? At this point in Mark's story, these guys still don't know who Jesus really is. And as we're about to see, even when they do know, they still don't get what that means. In spite of this, these are the people to whom Jesus gives the same authority he has to cast out unclean spirits and to proclaim the same message that he proclaims, to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And you know what? They do it. They're successful. As unskilled and unprepared and unworthy as these disciples are, they are able to do the deeds of power that Jesus cannot. Jesus' weakness in this story functions less like a shortcoming and more like an asset. As his disciples, and by extension we readers, begin to understand that this story isn't actually about Jesus. It's about what God is doing. And that involves us as well. So if this story is about you, where does it apply to what's happening in your life? Where are you feeling weak and overwhelmed, unable to do what you've been called to do? Or who do you have around you helping you to do the work that you can't do on your own? As I think about the answer to this question for myself, the first thing that comes to mind is our upcoming shift to hybrid worship. Now, many of us in this congregation remember the frustration of that shift to online worship over a year ago with its long-running hardware problems and technical glitches. I have to confess to you that I'm worried about those problems returning. A lot of people think I'm some sort of technical wizard, but I'm not. The truth is, I know enough to get myself into trouble, but not enough to always get myself out when it comes to computers. I'm worried that the problems that will arise because I don't feel equipped to solve them, and that those of you who choose to continue worshiping online will be, feel, will be left feeling disconnected and frustrated all over again, and that I won't be able to do anything about it. I feel a bit like Jesus and Nazareth, unable to live up to everyone's expectations. But this story reminds me that worship, even hybrid worship, even all the computer stuff, that's not my thing. It's our thing, right? I'm not called to do this alone. Even Jesus needed help. In fact, we might say needing help wasn't a bug, it was a feature. It shows us that even though Jesus is the central player in Mark's gospel story, he's not the only one. And he's not meant to be. The kingdom of God is not something created by or for the most pious or most impressive or most saintly people. It's something that we experience most fully in relationship and in cooperation and in participation. And that's exactly how God wants it. And that's why God has called us together and why we have found ways to stay together even when we couldn't gather physically. We are a team, and no matter how unskilled or unprepared or unworthy any of us might feel, each of us is called to contribute to God's kingdom. That's why Paul says that if he's going to boast, he's going to boast in his weakness, because his weakness, just like our weakness, shows God's weakness. 
And as Paul reminds us elsewhere, God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. In God's foolishness, our weaknesses are not things to be avoided or hidden or ashamed of. Instead, they can even be resources for the benefit of God's work. As disciples of Christ, we can claim and even boast about our shortcomings because we know that those shortcomings are opportunities for the goodness of God to be made manifest. In my story, my own inability to make hybrid worship happen on my own is a reminder to me and to all of us that worship is not something we consume for enjoyment, but a work in which we all participate, in which we all do our best, all for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. I, for one, am grateful for a reminder that this isn't the Seth show, because frankly, who would want to watch that? Instead, this is the means by which we all, physically and digitally, remain connected to one another and to the story of Jesus. So that's my story, but I'm curious. What's yours? Where have your shortcomings made space for new and greater things to blossom? How has God used your weakness to bless you or others? What people has God called into your life to walk alongside you in working for something bigger than yourselves? If we truly believe that we've been created in God's image, that includes even our weaknesses and our shortcomings. In Lewis's story, Aslan may have died in defeat, but only because he was able to entrust himself to a deeper, older magic. Even Jesus, enduring the taunts and the jeers of the crowd to come down from the cross and save himself, testifies to the source of all our help. The various thorns that we carry in our flesh show us how God intends for us to need one another, to need God. We are at our best when we are together, whether that together is physical or digital, or even spiritual, as when we are gathered together around the table with the communion of saints across space and time. The place where I fall short is the place where you can pick me up. I can't help but see the goodness of God in that.
The following people have been elected by the congregation at, to the Congregational Council. We give thanks for their willingness to serve. In baptism, we are welcomed into the body of Christ and sent to share in the mission of God. We now rejoice that these siblings will lead us in our common life and our mutual mission as a congregation. Marlene Bridgeforth, Charlene Franz, Linda Ryberry, Marilyn Collier, Jean Keast, Richard Ohm, Denny Sapp, Sherry Stava, Susan Whitney, and Lynette Brenton. In addition, these people have been elected by the congregation to serve on the board of the Little Lambs Preschool and to direct the mission of that uh, ministry of this congregation. Margaret Duncan, Aiko Park, Rob Powers, Jerry Meldy, and Nancy Johnson. It's with gratitude and joy that we also recognize our outgoing council members, Deb Bruckner, Beverly Buster, Bob Nussbaum, and Julie Bell, and our outgoing Little Lambs board members, Nels Peterson, Maggie Rogers, and Dave Markward. We thank you for your service to this community and for your time, effort, and energy that you have dedicated to the work of Christ in this place. We give thanks for their willingness to serve, and we now rejoice that these siblings will, be, will continue to lead this important, these important ministries of our congregation in caring for and raising up the children of our community. St. Paul writes, There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You all have been elected to positions of leadership and trust in this congregation. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith bear witness to God, who gathers us in, into one together with the whole church. You are to seek to, to involve all members of this congregation in worship, learning, witness, service, and support, so that the mission of Christ is carried out in this congregation, in the wider church, in this community, and in the whole world. You are being faithful to your specific area of serving, that the spirit who empowers you may be glorified. You are to be examples of faith active in love, fostering peace, harmony, and mutual understanding in this congregation. And so on behalf of your siblings in Christ, I ask you, will you accept and faithfully carry out the duties of the offices to which you have been elected? If so, please respond, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, I ask God to help me. People of God, though we cannot hear you, I ask you also to voice your commitment to these siblings in Christ. Will you support these, your elected leaders? And will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all who are baptized? If so, please respond. We will, and we ask God to help us. We will, and ask God to help us. I now declare you installed as council members and Little Lamb's board members of this congregation. Almighty God bless you and direct your days and your deeds in peace, that you may be faithful servants of Christ. Amen. 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 Let us come before our loving God in prayer. God of all, through the waters of baptism, you claim people of all races, ethnicities, and languages as your beloved children. Sustain the baptized, grow their faith, so that your gospel may be proclaimed and lived throughout all nations on your precious earth. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. God of the heavens, your creating spirit enlivens the universe. We give you thanks for the moon and stars, for the planets and the Milky Way, and for all the mysteries of the cosmos that remain unknown to us. Send your nurturing power to the earth, protect crops from drought and wilderness areas from harm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of freedom, you have liberated us from sin and death and rescued us from all forms of spiritual, social, and political oppression. 
Defend us from tyrants in our midst and deliver us from all forms of slavery or corruption. Direct our freedom for works of liberation and wholeness. Open our eyes and our hearts to recognize those in our very midst who are experiencing oppression of any kind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, you became vulnerable in the person of Jesus Christ in solidarity with the disempowered. Strengthen those who feel faint and forgotten. Give courage to those who live in fear and bring relief to those in need. For what and for whom do the people pray? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of holiness, you send us out into the world to serve with your love. We pray for our outreach ministries, such as Food Backpack for Kids and Fish Food Bank. Equip us as we leave this place to witness and to serve our neighbors without hesitation in love and kindness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of new beginnings, we pray for the mission congregations and worshiping communities in our Southwest Washington Synod. Today we pray especially for Rock City in Tacoma and Pastor Annie Jones Barnes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks that in every time and place, you call forth prophets who move us toward freedom. Thank you for those who work for human rights, for community organizers, and for all who strive for liberty for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our hearts to you, O oh God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and our homes to receive the Lord's Supper, let us pray. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, you we praise and glorify. You we worship and adore. You formed the earth from chaos. You encircled the globe with air. You created fire for warmth and light. You nourished the lands and the water. You molded us in your image, and with mercy higher than the mountains, and with grace deeper than the seas, you blessed the Israelites and cherished them as your own, so that we, estranged and dying, might be adopted to live in your spirit. You called us through the life and death of Jesus. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he'd given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together as the body of Christ, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember your Son, the firstborn of your new creation. We remember his life lived for others and his death and resurrection, which renews the face of the earth. We await his coming, when with the world made perfect through your wisdom, all our sins and sorrows will be no more. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Holy God, holy and merciful one, holy and compassionate, send upon us and upon this meal your Holy Spirit, whose breath revives us for life, whose fire rouses us to love, and fold in your arms all who share this holy food. Nurture in us the fruits of the Spirit, that we may be a living tree, sharing your bounty with all the world. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy and benevolent God, receive our praise and petitions as Jesus received the cry of the needy and fill us with your blessing until needy no longer and bound to you in love, we feast forever in the triumph of the Lamb through whom all glory and honor is yours, O God, O living one with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you are not receiving the meal today, then receive this blessing. May Jesus strengthen and nourish you your whole life through. Amen. If you are receiving the meal today, then hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in life that is abundant and eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. May God, who has brought us from death to life, fill you with great joy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Bless you now and forever. Amen. Before we conclude, I'd like to share just a few announcements. Um, as you all know, on July 25th, Anus Day's building will be reopening and will be gathering for hybrid worship for the first time. Some of our community will be present in the building, while others will continue to be present online. This new hybrid worship will mean a few small changes for those who worship with us. First, if you're planning to come in person, please remember that you will need to RSVP ahead of time to plan for ad adequate physical distancing in the worship space. You can do that either online, we're setting something up for that, or by uh, over the phone. Masks will still be required for uh, those who worship in person for the safety of all who gather. We're planning to have two services, one at 8.30 a.m., the other at 11 a.m., please plan to arrive at least 15 to 20 minutes early so that we can facilitate getting everybody checked in and seated on time. If you're planning to continue worshiping online, the live stream can be found on this channel at 8.30 a.m. Once the service is over, the recording will remain available through the week, so you can watch it at your convenience. If for some reason technical difficulties prevent us from streaming the worship at 8.30, check back again at 11. Finally, I want to once again extend the invitation to everyone who will be continuing to worship online to participate in our worship through reading lessons or as an assisting minister. Having both digitally and physically present volunteers is an important sign of the wholeness of this community across time and space and cyberspace. If you'd like more information about how you can be a part of that hybrid worship from the comfort of your own home, please email the church office at office at anustaylutheran.org, or you can contact us via our website or our Facebook page. This is going to be a big change, and it means having to adjust. But we are very excited to be able to expand our worship to include both in-person and online participate, participation. Thank you for your grace and your flexibility during this time. And please know please let us know how we can improve what we are doing. We expect our worship services to keep evolving just as they have been throughout this entire pandemic as we continue to grow in learning and in our comfort level with technology. Thank you for continuing this journey together with us. And thank you for being a part of this community. 
It is good to gather as God's people to be renewed in faith and reassured of God's promises. If you found today's service meaningful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel, where On Use Day gathers for worship every Sunday. And be sure to find us on the web at onusedaylutheran.org, where you can get involved with Bible studies and service groups and many other ministries that are happening both in person and online. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Thank you.